All right, thanks again for joining me. Um, I have a very fun and exciting guest with me tonight. Uh, she's Rosa Del Duca, uh, author of Breaking Cadence. So let's, uh, let's not waste any time. Let's bring on Rosa. Are you there, Rosa? I'm here. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. She is the author of Breaking Cadence. Uh, we'll get into that here. Uh, but Rosa, tell me a little bit about uh, your background and kind of kind of more geared towards your experience into uh, joining the National Guard while you're still in high school. Sure. Um, first time I've been described as fun and exciting, maybe. <laughs> We've had some good conversations in the past, so I'm 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 fun. I'm I'm excited, and I'm going to have some fun. So I love that. Yeah. I'm fun. I get to be fun. <laughs> well, um, speaking of unfun, though, uh, so I was recruited when I was 17 years old, up in rural, rural Montana. It was a year before 9/11, and um, you know I was a uh, had just started my senior year in high school. And was looking for a way to pay for college because I really, really wanted to go. I wanted to study journalism. I wanted to be a writer. And I that's why I tuned out all the recruiters until the National Guard guy, because they they were all, you know, join right away. Then you do your two or four years and then you get to go to college. And I didn't want to do that. Um, but the National Guard guy came in and couched it as, you know, very part time job one weekend a month, two weeks in the summer. Yep. Um, so I leapt at that opportunity, joined the guard. Then 9-11 happened. And as the, the wars on terror unfolded, you know, I realized what a huge mistake I had made. Like not only did I not belong in uniform, but I really did not want anything to do with, in particular, the war in Iraq, which I saw as completely illegal, and fabricated, and um, I just couldn't believe that we were marching toward war more and more. I, the critics were saying like, no, the diplomats were saying, no, the weapons inspectors in the country are like, we don't, we don't, nothing's here. We don't see any weapons of mass destruction. Um, and yet, you know, it was just like this freight train toward, toward war. And then the soldier stories started coming back of, you know, like, we don't have any body armor or oh. we're terrorizing civilians. You know, you've heard it all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's really hard, especially uh, everything considering that's happened in the last, say, you know, five years to kind of put ourselves back into that post or uh, pre 9-11 world um, of, you know, I've heard it as described as like a like an all you can drink $5 cup at the door, you know, party, uh, that pre 9-11 world that we lived in that was just kind of just, you know, everyone's, everyone's just having a grand old time, you know, and we live in this post 9-11 world now where it's just uh, one chaotic event after another, um, you know, and, and to include everything that's happening today on, on here, the 22nd of February with uh, everything wrapping up with Russia and Ukraine and everything. Um, but, uh, you know, it, when you're 17, you're impressionable, you get misled. Um, you know, I, I joined the National Guard straight out of, uh, well, straight out of dropping out of college um, in efforts to, you know, get college paid for again. And uh, uh, you, <laughs> I, and so I joined in 2003, so in January, and it was, you know, literally months before the Iraq invasion. And so I, I was never one to wanting to be in the military. Um, I was just kind of like, I, I kind of have no options here, which is, you know, kind of the, the story that you hear so often with so many people where they're just kind of like, I don't, I can't pay for school. Um, you know, and so I, I didn't, was un, unaware of the National Guard as well. Um, I had a stepfather who had retired from the Air National Guard and was the only reason why I knew anything about it. Uh, and he didn't really even talk about it that much. Um, and so, you know, I had joined kind of the same guys as you, because when I was talking to other people in the Air Guard, they were like, yeah, we go, but we go to like Kuwait or Qatar and we kind of hang out for a few months and we get some tax free money. And then everyone, you know, comes back with a, you know, 10 or 20 grand in their pocket, you know, and it was sort of this described as more of like this, like, 
paid vacation of sorts that you're, you know, and, and uh, um, where it's, you're, you're not going to see any action, whatever, whatever. Right. Um, so, you know, there's this, this idea with the national guard, especially pre nine 11, when, when you were signing up that it was this really just self described as like this very part-time job. Um, yeah. And not only that, it's the national guard, like you're protecting your state. Yes. There's wildfires that break out. Right. You get to, you know, help move uh, firefighters around or help in floods or whatever. Like that's what the National Guard was known for doing. Right, right. Yeah. And then like in, in my area, we'd always have floods from the Mississippi River and stuff like that. So the National Guard would go out and do sandbags, you know, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And, and and it's as as my experience, you know, when year, year after year, I, I realized really quick that uh, whether it's air guard or army guard, um, they're kind of the first to go in these, in these types of deployments, um, which yeah. is kind of not still not completely understood. Even 20, no, people are shocked when I, when I, if I, you know, it's always dangerous telling civilians your military past and especially me, because I was a conscientious objector. Yeah. Well, I am a conscientious objector, even though the military did not, you know, bestow upon me that distinction in paperwork sure. but you know i tell them yeah you, know, you know i was in the national guard i ended up being a co and they're like well you were in the national guard you wouldn't have gone over anyway yeah. i'm like uh um <laughs> no they're the first to go reserve yeah. and it's so bad because it's backwards thinking right it is why would you send in the people with the least experience and resources and cohesion the national guard and the and the army reserves first yeah makes no sense Makes no sense, but that's the U.S. military. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure it comes down to dollars because, you know, state dollars, you know, funds the the National Guard. Uh, the reserves are a federally funded um, deal, but I'm sure there's some sort of like uh, backdoor money saver in, in doing that, you know. And so what do they look at? They look at like training. Oh, do you have these boxes checked? Oh, you've done this, this, and this training. You're, you're qualified. Boom, you're out the door, you know. Um, it, it, it is so bizarre how how those standards are kind of set between between the those components of the regular services and the reserves and the national guard that's a really good point i'm sure now it has something to do with money yeah <laughs> it always does right let's let's yeah. ourselves <laughs> um yeah no and so the i was believe it or not I did not even know about conscientious objector. I spent 10 years between the, the Air National Guard and the active duty army. Um, that, that was something that I wasn't even aware of. And then I forget how I may have come across you on like Twitter. That's the thing I was trying to think about earlier when I was uh, inviting you on. I'm like, I, I can't remember how I got in touch with you initially because it's been a couple of years at least. Yeah, um, I, was, I was wondering that same thing too. I was like, how did he find out about was it no was it through about face that could have been it that could have been it there's something through about face um yeah that was the other thing i was trying to think about i'm like did i find out about you through about face or did you tell me about i can't remember but regardless um you know your story like totally intrigued me i'm like what is this and then and then um bought your book read it and was just like this is one hell of a story that like people do not know is even a thing. Yeah. And I didn't know what uh, a conscientious, well, I knew vaguely what the idea of conscientious objection was because of you know just normal U S history and the Vietnam war and those guys who were drafted and then were became a CEO and burned their draft cards in the street and that kind of thing. I had that vague recollection, but I had no idea that I could be a conscientious objector because like we all do now, it's the all volunteer army, right. volunteer mil military, you, you sign up. So therefore you can't be a conscientious objector when you sign up, but that's the secret. And I, I still call it the secret because it is. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. most people in the military now don't know that they could become a conscientious objector. If they want to, but yeah, it, it wasn't until I was I was called up and then went into ROTC at the last minute because they're like everyone <laughs> everyone wants to recruit you at all times, right? Yeah. So they're like, oh, my ROTC guy was probably thinking, hey, this girl's probably desperate to finish her college degree and not be deployed right now. I'll recruit her into ROTC. 
at Cal, uh, by this time I was at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And, um, but because it was so last minute, I had to go through the motions to deploy. You know, you go to the, this like mobilization training where they tell you to bump up your life insurance. They give you another physical. You have to fill out a mountain of paperwork and in the mountain of paperwork, there was one paper with a box that you could check and it said, are you a conscientious objector? And it was just like a lightning bolt and a thunderclap like, what? You know, is that, is that kind of what you were thinking when you, when you first glanced at that? Yeah. I was like, that is exactly what I am. Yeah. I'm a conscientious objector and there's a box I can check for that. Was it like in the, the, the tiniest font imaginable like at the bottom or was it was it was it right there and smack dab in the middle yeah it was kind of in the middle like buried okay. under in between stuff and yeah. like this box that you could check and and I um yeah then my brain just started going into hyperdrive like sure. what the heck I didn't know that I could be a conscientious objector if I check this they're gonna be mad at me and I don't know how they're defining it I don't know what the qualifications are like, I got to go home and figure this out because yeah. that that's exactly what I am. Um, and then how do you, how can you be in the military and a conscientious objector? So, because, you know, it's pounded on us, any, any of us who've been through like basic training and, in, 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 you know, AIT or whatever, um, it's beaten into you that like you're, you're an order follower through and through. That's, that's, there's no, there's no like two ways about it. You know, that's how you get article 15s. That's how you get you know, in, in trouble is, is not following orders. And what, or, what is the greatest order, but to follow an order to go into war. Right. Um, and so, it, yeah, I would, have I would, if I would have recognized that when I was in that position, I, I never deployed specifically to any war zones. Like I've been, I've been to 17 countries and none of them were Iraq or Afghanistan or, um, you know, Syria or any of these other places. Um, but, you know, I did go through like this, like deployment process where you're filling up, just as you described, where you're, you know, doing your life insurance and this and that and the other thing, you know, because I was in, I was in Egypt for a year and not considered a war zone, but that's considered like, no, you know, uh, like a high risk assignment. I forget what they, how they defined it, but, you know, so I, I'm sure I had that option as well. And I just like, what up? I was, you know, in the mode of just like whatever paperwork I got to fill out just so I can get the hell over there, you know, um, that's where my mind was. And I'm sure that if I was in the position of, Hey, you're going to Iraq or Afghanistan and it's not going to be in the best of situations. And, you know, and I, I kick myself for not being more like you, um, looking back at my 10 year career. Uh, granted, I didn't, I didn't go through the, you know, being, getting called up for, for actual war. Um, but there was a, you know, just a lot of things later on after I was able to kind of like pause and look back at my career and go, yeah, that was kind of messed up. You know, um, I probably shouldn't have been involved, <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, go here. So here's what I would like you to get into is, so you are called up, I believe what, um, like a, a year into it after you had signed up is that about or were we looking at maybe like two two and a half years in right I because would... because the actual deployment didn't start until 2003 you signed up in 2000 is that right let's see I think I, I th yeah I signed up in 2000 like late 2000 sure but you know I I also had the luxury of having more time to think about these things because I was in the National Guard and just because of the screwy way my service ended up when I went to boot camp my first summer after joining a month in I got mono and an enlarged right. spleen and they sent me home and so right. I had that whole next year as 9-11 happened we invaded Afghanistan right whole year and I'm studying journalism I'm watching stuff going on to like process things and then I did boot camp and then because I was a split op split option in the National Guard I had a whole nother year before I could even become deployable because you do your boot camp one year and then you're in school and then you do your AIT training the next year right and because I was you know in the National Guard a citizen soldier I had I was I was still in the civilian world enough where I think I 
you know, was just able to process more, think more, watch the news more and yes. like gauge my feelings and my and notice that my instincts are screaming like ah, run what did you do oh what yeah. did you do yeah yeah you have and you have the influence of your family your friends you know forget just the media right um and then you know and and plus you're you're a civilian so you're you know you're living in the comforts of your your home the comforts of like the the college campus you know like the i'm sure i i I can't put myself back specifically back into that time. Um, Code Pink was really strong back in those days. I don't know if they had like a huge influence where you were going to school at at all, but I'd have to imagine that some of the student body was even anti-war. That's the thing. Once I transferred to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo on the Central Coast, there was not a hint of anti-war sentiment there. So it was like living in this strange parallel universe where the war did not exist at all. And I was so irritated and peeved at all of my classmates just wandering around campus. And I'm so stressed out by my business class. I just, it's so hard, you know, yeah. <laughs> and just sports were going on as normal. I, yeah. uh, nobody seemed to recognize like you guys were at war in two countries too yeah. right now. Like this is a college campus. Yeah, I expected something, demonstrations, protests, something, anything, but no, really no. Interesting. Yeah, because, um, you know, I just, in my head, I'm just thinking, oh, West Coast, you know, California, you know, Bush's president, you know, every, <laughs> everything like would just kind of add up like, oh, maybe this is a bad idea. The, the bumbling idiot who can't like formulate a sentence is sending us to war in two countries simultaneously, you know? Yeah, I think it definitely was in SF and LA, but um, but where I was, it was pretty removed. Yeah, that's 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 something I would have never guessed. And so, you know, but, but at bare minimum, you do have the influence of your you know friends and family, like you said, the media, um, uh, and and the media not doing that great of a job of of uh, convincing people that this is probably not a great idea. There was some of that in there, but I don't think they. I think it was more of a uh, push towards than rather than uh, against, but um, either way, you're you're studying journalism, so you're you're seeing it with with a different lens than most people are, I would imagine. Yeah, what was interesting about that is, um, you know, I got really involved in the campus radio station, and they uh, they got a year of Amy Goodman's Democracy Now for free. That's right. I remember and because I was. Now. Yeah, I was the news director, so it was kind of my responsibility to help make sure that that segment was ready for a DJ to hit play and play the hour-long program or whatever. Um, and and then I was also interning at this news talk station. It was super conservative and ran Rush Limbaugh back to back with Sean Hannity. So <laughs> I was exposed to these diametrically opposed um, ways of covering the war, looking at it. Um, and, you know, yeah, listening to Amy Goodman and just how she's, she's just so open and unbiased and, and was interviewing, interviewing vets, interviewing um, guys who, who uh, basic, basically deserted at that point. Some of them were trying to become a CEO and some of them were deserters. And, um, and she was referring to it as an occupation, which that makes sense, of, you know, like to the Iraqis and Afghanis. Um, yeah, it was an occupation. We were occupying their country, you know, and then, you know, the traditional media is being like, you know, the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. You know, like, right. We are the liberators. The yeah. and then whatever freedom for Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. and, both, and then both, John Hannity and both times, and both times is the, using the word freedom, where it's like the, there's know nothing about freedom about either one of these missions here but, yeah you know. so icky yeah anyway and then yeah and then I'd go to work and listen to just this hateful wrong-headed closed-minded just uh, being spewed out for two yeah. <laughs> three hours and then that yeah that really got the gears turning and I was examining my own beliefs and ethics and and and, and everything my whole perspective so yeah, it's, that's, um, that's such a different, um, 
the way you described it, that, that, that whole, like your, your, your training is broken up. Plus, plus you endured the, the illness, which even broke it up even more. Um, which that, that can still happen on the active side where they, where they, you know, are too ill or injured to complete the training. And so they have to pause and come back. You know, it's a little bit, a little bit of a quicker process on the active side, but just being that you were national guard and everything's broken up. A lot of things are broken up in the national guard side for various reasons. A lot of them is like budgeting. A lot of them is just like open slots, like um, active duty gets like priority and a lot of like the tech training and stuff like that. So it can happen to anyone. I'm surprised that there's not more of that on the National Guard side just for that reason alone. Yeah, because when you think about it, I, I mean, I really do think that that had a lot to do with me being open-minded and kind of a free thinker and 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 allowing myself to be like, um, no, I'm, I'm definitely, well, you know, it took me a really really long time to come to that point where I'm like you know what yeah I'm okay with being labeled a traitor and a coward and whatever the heck like they can think whatever I want but I'm not I'm not doing this it took me a long time to get there but you know from the very start it's just you're you're so cut off from the outside world and any mentors and voices of reason you know you go into boot camp they take everything away you're mm -hmm. you know you're you don't have a phone you're locked in at night you're you're allotted like what your 10 minute phone call on a right. saturday or sunday and man you have to you guys have got stand it. in line for <laughs> do you remember that oh yeah no i remember I, those were the so i went through in 2003 and um we had to use you know pay phones and we had yeah. to get we had to go to the px and get um calling card yep phone card yep so that we can actually make a phone call to you know someone back home and then you like cross your fingers like please pick up please pick up because like it was just like that was your one opportunity you yeah. Know. And uh, if the line was too long, then you were shit out of luck that week. Yep. Yeah. And it, and all that. Yeah. <laughs> so you're completely cut off. Like if you're yeah. having doubts or misgivings or questions or anything, you can't talk to anybody. And then you go through the whole, um, you know, team building and, you know, breaking you down to build you up stronger. And, and you do make bonds, you know, like I felt super close to the people I went through boot camp with. Yeah. Same. You know, or not to. Yeah, it's hard not to. It's same with AIT. And then it's just the the culture of, yeah, of, it's so taboo not to just do what you're told and to do it well and bite your tongue and shut the fuck up. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you better go along with everything or y your life will be miserable. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, that's why I say like, I, I always thought I had some kind of contrarian kind of uh, perspective on things. And, and when I, when I joined, like, I just was like, I got to just shut my mouth and just do what I'm told. And like, I just, I like, I latched onto that. Um, and there were, there was barely a moment where I was like def defying anyone in my, in my 10 year, year career. Um, and, you know, and I've, when I, when I got out, I, I also got divorced. And so like, I, I did like this whole kind of like step back of, of my like life, the last, the, you know, the last 10 years. And, and I was, so I was a journalist um, and, you know, looking back at my work and just going, that was all propaganda, you know, and, and it wasn't even war propaganda. Cause I didn't go to war. I went, I, I did peacekeeping and humanitarian missions, you know, and, you know, on like the, the humanitarian stuff, it was just like, like variations of the truth like there was there was nothing that I was saying that was a lie but there was but there was a whole component of like I'm not telling the full story at all you know and it's so funny because I wanted your job yeah <laughs> that's what I wanted to sign up as you know I was yeah. like I oh I can write in and out of uniform like I can be right a journalist for the military and then as I got you know older and and in it more and started you know then I realized that I was like I'm not going to be a journalist. I'll, I'll, it'll be PR and it'll be fluff and it'll be edited out and, and, uh, you know, scrutinized and yeah, it'll, it's, yeah. it'll be propaganda if I go in the war zone. Yeah. Um, or not. That's, that's what I found out was like, you don't even have to go to a war zone for it to be propaganda. I mean, like I, I went on an, um, a five month mission with the Navy doing a, a medical mission in Central and South America and the Caribbean. And, um, you know, everything we did was just, 
yeah, did we help some people? Yeah, there's some people who, you know, got some, uh, you know, surgery for cleft lips and club feet and stuff like that. And, you know, there's some other people who got some other procedures done, you know, but the, the bulk of the people got ibuprofen, you know, and, and so I was saying that we saw you know, how many ever people we saw per country, 2000 people, whatever the case may be. And my, I have this fluff piece, you know, this, um, about this uh, kid getting some, you know, medical procedure that they would have never gotten had we not been there. Is that true? Yes. Did we see 2000 people? Yes. Did the 2000 people get that procedure? No, but I didn't, I didn't connect those dots, but I left the, that in the article for the reader to, to connect those dots. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's very manipulative. And that's the genius too of like, Oh, the military will have its own journalists, its own PR thing. It's, it's newspapers, it's radio right. stations and all that, because then the mainstream media picks that stuff up and they're like, Oh, well, these are, you know, facts that this military journalist gathered and here's the paper trail and, and everything. And the media loves those kind of stories because for the very reason that we all do, like we all want to see us doing cool, badass, helpful things right. out in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, and, and, you know, I look back and then, so I started to study language more. I started to study like origins of language and started to understand like evolution of language like I, I think I've talked about this on another show but there was um this uh I, I did I read this study about golden lion tamarins in in the treetops of Brazil and they're like these little monkeys that you can like fit in the palm of your hand and they travel in like groups of like 50 to 100 and they have like a group that's it's in the front that are like the elders they have the bulk of the group that's like the kind of the middle aged group and then they have the young ones in the back and the older group likes to um, so they use these calls. There's about 50 different calls that they make that mean food, you know, movement, danger, you know, that kind of stuff. And so the old group would tell the middle group, like all this factual information, the middle group would fudge up that info and like tell like half truths and like uh, all this stuff to the, to the back, because let's face it, it's kind of, you know, it's survival skill, you know? And uh, so there was that whole part of it where it's like this isn't even a human thing this is just an animal thing to to lie and to, <laughs> to, to you know not completely tell the truth and the and the the thing that really kind of surprised me the most was within that study they they figured out that the closest relationships between all the different uh monkeys was food sharing it had nothing to do with communication at all and everything to do with like actual like something tangible something that you can can show and exchange and and those those cause the creative the the biggest bonds between between each individual and so i took that really to heart and i was like you know i, I like to talk i like to do this obviously i like to have conversations with people but i like i started to realize like it's my actions that actually hold any kind of value whatsoever um and so the more i hear um, people talk without action, the more I find them to be distrusting because it's, let's face it, we may even be thinking that we're, we're telling some version of the truth and we could be totally wrong. That's the other thing that you have to like kind of take in consideration. I don't mean to go too off the rails with, but that's just kind of how I see journalism and communication in general. No, I love that. And I love that philosophy too of, you know, that ac actions speak louder than words because they so do. Yeah. Act you know, you can say you care about the environment, but if you're not, you know, changing, you know, what you eat based on her, its carbon footprint and yeah. I don't know, conserving water in a drought and, could, you know, doing, doing something right. about it, who cares? Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if you're a government official and you're, and you're all just hot air, like, oh, we have to, protect uh you know the the sanctity of the country we have to you know fight them over there so we don't do it over here you know if you're if you're just always advocating blowing people up you know yeah. it, it's <laughs> like i don't i'm sorry dude i can't trust you you know yeah that, that's what it really came down to because i had an issue where in a conscientious objector application they make you say that um the the bar that you have to meet is you have to be against any and all wars and so when I really thought about it, that I was like, well, I definitely would have been involved in some way in World War 
too, whether it was, you know, like the Rosie the Riveter people or, or whatever, I would have been totally fine, not only fine, but wanting to do something if I was in, alive in World War II. But ever since then, uh, I, I was like, any conflict that the US military has involved, been involved in has been a disaster or a disaster, an unjust war, some kind of, you know, fucked upness about it. And so I, yeah, I, I, I don't trust, I don't trust our government and the military enough to be involved in anything that they are involved in, in my lifetime. <laughs> In our lifetime and going back probably 50, 60 years, you know? Yeah. So that's how I came to terms with that one. Cause, cause you're right. You know, it's just, they're going to like in Ukraine, I, I don't know how we're going to get involved, but I know we are. Yeah. And I just don't trust that we're going to do that in the most productive, wise, um, peaceful way that we possibly could. I just don't. And, and j I'll just brush up on the Ukraine Russia thing just a little bit, but you know, with the how I've just seen how they've been advocating and justifying just any involvement at all has been like, well, you you know, Russia is going to um, you know possibly invade Ukraine, and they've got you know military uh, units on the border, you know, and and that's supposed to you know all of a sudden just set off this alarm in the American. Uh, population to go like well that's we that we can't have that well is that tr go, kind of going back to what I was saying before is that true yes the, the the story that I write was it true yes what are they largely leaving out is the fact that we have 800 military bases all over the world that aren't even in our borders right they're in these all these countries all around the world there's a there's a that meme uh it's a it's a map of Iran, right? And then you have all these like American flags around it that, that identify all the American military bases around it. And the, and the caption is, why did Iran put their country in the middle of all of our military bases? And so like, that's, that's something that they're leaving out of this conversation that they're having right now, which is like, oh, Russia's, Russia's getting aggressive. Russia's getting aggressive? What have we been doing for 50, 60 years? Yeah. And, that, and that's the problem too with modern journalism. It's, it's so many newsrooms are shrinking and shrinking and we, you know, attention spans, we assume that the attention spans of the consumers, people who are watching the news, listening and reading are getting smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter. So you have yeah. fewer resources, nobody who's, at, you know, hardly anybody who's actually reporting from Ukraine and, and Russia. Right. And right. then the attention span is gone too and the content is whittled down and you're not taking like a large historical look at things you know not enough experts being interviewed and it's just like yeah weird, weird pundits and posturing and officials who are touting the party line it's just the coverage of it too is suspect you know yeah. we don't really know the full story and the and the the experts are like these uh, former generals and and admirals and stuff, and it's just like, uh, and then you know, and then they become part of Raytheon and and uh, and and all the Lockheed Martin and all these weapon manufacturers, and it's just like this pipeline from one part of being the warmonger to the next, you know, and it's the whole scratch your back, I'll scratch yours kind of oh yeah thing happening too, you know. Right. So how would they not advocate? war when that is their profession exactly and you know that the pentagon budget is going to get not only approved but oh let's give them more money let's give them some more yep yep baffling ah uh, that's the that's the fun part isn't it um i uh okay so i'm gonna go we're gonna shift gears a little bit to your book um there like the end was really just just threw me aside and I was I was going through it earlier today because I do like to um mark certain things when I'm reading uh I got to go back to you were dealing with some like kind of private um like I, I forget what this the guy's title was uh let me find it oh my god I had it marked and then I lost it but you were dealing with someone to help you it was like some sort of like lawyer do you know what I'm referring to now I can't yeah find yeah it. I had to hire two lawyers um, because they denied denied my application in a way where they 
well the first rebuttal they were like no you're not a ceo we don't believe you and we want you to pay back all the money that we've ever given you yeah i remember that too you were mentioning that as well and then my second lawyer it was when they denied me for the final time and there was no more rebutting it and um yeah so my my second lawyer he took it on pro bono he's in san francisco and that guy was cool, right? If I remember right. Yeah, Stephen Collier. Yeah, because there was another guy. My... Yeah. I can't find it now. I had it marked earlier. I should have kept it marked. Um, but it was it was a guy who was like talking about BlackRock, I remember. Um, I don't know if you remember when you were talking about this guy. Oh, do you you mean here um we here we go? Stinson. Stinson. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to read just this, uh, and you can kind of fill in where I'm kind of leaving some stuff out here. Um, so it starts out and, and I, I want to let people know too, like, this is brilliantly written, like, like a novel. Um, I loved that it was like written like a novel and not just like, as like an autobiography. Um, Ew. I was not expecting that at all. And I don't, I don't normally read novels. I normally read, you know, nonfiction. Um, you know, obviously this is nonfiction, but it, it, it has like a, a novel kind of uh, way it was written. So anyway, um, so there's this part here. Here's how I think of it, Hunt said. You know how people say it's a different world now, or they call it the post 9-11 world. We have to accept that wars are completely different than in the past. I, for one, feel a whole lot safer knowing we're over there taking care of business. If more people join the US military, there'd be no need for companies like Blackwater. Uh, and then Stinson says, when we wipe the terrorists out, we'll all get to come home and enjoy peace. And what year is it now? 2022? Yeah. What are we still, what is still going on and what is still going to keep going on? Because we've had so many, uh, you know, tragedies over the years since 2001, right? We've had like a, a almost a complete economic collapse. We've had uh, just a absolutely, a, a, I don't even want to know what to, what to call the, the, the four years of Trump in office. It was just, it was just total chaos for four years. And then, um, and then you had, you know, obviously Corona. And so like, there's so many like things that have happened since the global war on terror that people don't even know this is still a thing like you still are going to get the global war on terror ribbon when you join the military when you join the service like that's people don't know that when you got uh assigned to korea in the army or the air force you got the korean war ribbon because it never technically ended yeah. these are the types of things that you know are we are so miseducated on you know and we there's that just people don't understand that these aren't like temporary measures. There's no like war end date like there was with World War One, World War II. Surprise! I'm surprised that Vietnam War ever ended. To be perfectly honest with you, just the way I've seen how things, you know, progress when it comes to military intervention. Yeah, and I, I yeah, that scene was uh, when I actually asked my my little squad, you know, what they thought because. It was another example of how close you get to people in training and you start to really, you know, like admire them and love them and respect them. And that yeah. I thought there, there must, I can't be the only one with misgivings about what's going on. And so, you know, I kind of asked them and not, I didn't confront them, but started this conversation and it went so, <laughs> it was just, I should have known better, you know, but Stinson, he was the baby of the platoon. He was 18 or 19 years old. And I think it just speaks to how, how sheltered and naive and how in black and white so many teenagers, th these are kids. These yeah. are kids who end up in going, fighting all of our wars. It's our, our youngest and most idealistic and sometimes bravest people that go right. over there or the most desperate, right? Economic draft. Well, yeah, it's desperate. It's desperation. It's like, oh, I'm invincible. I'm 18. I'm 20, whatever the case may be. Like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-layered like reason for why, you know, um, just impressionable, uh, you know, all that stuff. And it's, it's, it's a combination of like, these are the perfect 
people to manipulate to join something to think like hey and, and this is something that i i really started to drive home recently was like we got to ditch this whole hero kind of um um worship hero worship hero worship for for troops it's got to go away and like i understand the whole reasoning behind it for like you know vietnam vets getting spit on when they came home and it's like well the pendulum slung all the way to the other side right to the point where um everyone who just puts the uniform on is a hero it's like are you out of your fucking mind have you met some of these people these people are crazy and yeah. like in, in, for the worst reasons you know i met yeah, some that's the thing and i met some really bad crazy yeah oh my gosh you're you're so right but it's hard it's so hard to do that because i feel like anyone in uniform they're just treated as one same part of the whole you know and you want to honor and thank the whole but yeah you have to treat everyone as an individual because everyone is yeah. <laughs> different and a different individual and some people can can truly and honestly be super proud of their service and maybe they are a hero but some other people who have been yeah given the hero badge like they did they committed war crimes yeah they committed atrocities they didn't help the situation at all they added to the the whole fucked upness of it yes. um but you can't you can't ask a veteran that like well <laughs> like how terrible would that be like, well let's give you the the, and, test. And the other end of that right with the whole hero kind of uh um aspect to it where it's like they were literally like the supply guy you know where like you're gonna put that dude in the same like category as the people who were like watching their friends getting blown up you know like you're gonna give them that same kind of hero title yeah that's you're gonna give people who don't deserve a big head a big head you know yeah and then and just oh god and it just, it just takes a toll on on everyone too though and it's like here we're gonna name you a hero but when you develop ptsd and screw up somehow and we kick you out of the military and then the civilian world doesn't give you a job it just gets so messy too because it's like well am i a hero like do i deserve some the rights of like employment and uh, mental health and everything and all that stuff or am i going to be another one of the homeless vets under the bridge it's just so screwy how our our culture deals with veterans just yeah it's it's so messy and then you know and then we can get into the whole thing too about the va and how their whole like medical record system is so jacked um you know there was stuff that i was reading about probably about close to 10 years ago now i've been out since 2013 but i remember reading about um there was a like a place that held records in virginia somewhere and they took a picture of this uh, inside of this office building. It was like an entire floor, one of those like, you know, floors inside an office building that like it was um, rows of file cabinets, right? That were just filled, all of them filled with medical records bound together. And then on top of the file cabinets that were probably, that's probably stood about five feet high, were stacks of other um, medical records, again, bound and, you know, and, and just who how what kind of system is that you know um it, and and you know i i've dealt with the va i don't know of uh, any of your experiences at all with them um <laughs> i i'm i've been waiting on uh, glasses since november um that have been sent to me and wrong glass like it's just it the, it's a mess and and like some people have like just perfectly fine experiences um but it's it's just another one of those added we're not going to help you out after the fact kind of things that this system that exists does help in some aspects with veterans but you know it's 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 really mismanaged yeah totally i mean being in the newsroom over the years every every couple of years you know i'm writing stories about horrible va care and you know the walter reed was um i don't yeah just scandals and just those nightmare stories of you know people i have a missing limb and i have not 
I don't have a prosthetic for my missing limb for a year, stuff like that. And I've never personally dealt with it because when I um, became a CEO and I just, I was like, I'm, I'm not dealing with totally understandable. Yeah. Any, <laughs> and I don't think I could too. Cause you know, I don't have a DD214. I never truly out processed. And I think they might have done that on purpose. They're like, we're going to make sure that she can't use us for any anything else. It's almost like you, um, and uh, and uh, by no means am I putting you down by saying this, but like, it's almost like you gave yourself like a dishonorable discharge, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think, for I'm the really right reasons, shocked. I say that, yeah. Yeah, I was shocked that on, on paper, I got an honorable discharge because in okay. the end, yeah, I never, I never really got an answer. I was prepared with that that lawyer in San Francisco to take on the federal government in court if I had to, because when they denied my application, they didn't give me a reason why they didn't believe that I was a CO. And so it's, it, it will always be a mystery. Why the heck? From the time that you initially started the conscientious objector process to the time where it was completed, what, what? Uh, I can't remember exactly what time frame are we looking at here? Like how long did the take from start to finish? It was about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cause you, you spend a couple months building your huge application then you submit it. And then you have to go through the three hoops, which is meet with a army chaplain, um, army psychologist, an investigating officer has assigned your case and they they try to dig up dirt on you and then they have like basically an interrogation. Then, um, you know, they make their conclusion. You get to rebut their conclusion because of course the first one, they're going to just be like, oh, fuck you, you're not a CEO. Like, we don't believe right. you, no. <laughs> and yeah. then you rebut it and then they rebut you. And then it, it spends about a year going all the way up to the Pentagon where all CEO cases are still decided. At the Pentagon level, some strangers in a room reading your packet um, and then if they say no then if you want to fight it then that drags on even longer so obviously a totally different experience so i got medically retired and i had to go through the that whole medical board process mm. and the the parallel there is like you're you're going through you're you're seeing the doctor they're, they're examining you for everything that you've basically made a claim for that you've had an issue with in your in your career um, and then, and then it goes to, uh, so I went through it in, at Fort Hood. So there was a team on at Fort Hood that was handling my case and making sure like I was going through it, the procedure as, as, as planned. And then it does go, once you've completed all the steps there, it does go to, I can't remember it was somewhere in like Washington state or something like that. Uh, again, a room full of people who have never met you, who don't know anything about your case, who are just look, literally looking at documents and making a difference termination from that so it it's it's at all levels of of like getting out you know that's so crazy yeah and I even had to extend my orders to go past the date that I was supposed to get out to make sure that the process ended and I was going through a horrible marriage at the time and I hated my command um it wasn't my command it was really like my first line soup that I absolutely could not stand um, and I was living in Colleen, Texas, where if you've ever been there, I can't imagine that you would, but if you do just turn around and leave immediately, because it's one of the worst places to live in the world. And I can say that because I've been across the planet and I can say with certainty that it's one of the worst places to live. And I lived in Egypt when they didn't have a government and you had to carry around an M4 with you wherever you went. So clean is way worse. I'll put it, I'll put it that way. Um, so yeah, and so I had to get my orders extended. I was I was debating like I'm like I just want to get out. Um, I'm glad I didn't do that. I'm glad I went through the process. Um, but yeah, it they they do make your life just so miserable when you're going through that process of getting out. Yeah, and isn't that funny? That's another thing that kids don't realize at 17, 18, signing up. Like, this is the job. You can't quit. This is right. not. McDonald's this is not being a teacher this is not a gen yeah. like any other job any other job you yeah. can be like you know what I'm gonna do something else and put in your two weeks or walk off the job right there no consequences yeah. but no this job it's different <laughs> very and like uh I don't so I don't know if you've had much experience of talking to 
eight, 17, 18, 19 year olds now about joining. Um, I, I was going to, and then this family was, I was dealing with like the aunt and uncle of this kid who was thinking about joining. They were trying to talk them out of it. So they were talking to me to give them reasons to talk him out of it. I was hoping to actually speak to the kid, but it never happened. But I would love to start talking to some of these kids because I mean, I was so misled, you know, in, you know, 20 years ago. And, um, you know, I'm under the impression that uh, a lot of people that in that age don't really have a full grasp of like what responsibility is and what taking care of things are. And so, you know, I, I worry about just them even having the low level paying jobs, let alone joining the service and understanding what the, what they're getting into. Um, Cause you and I both, you know, went through that experience, not knowing exactly what we were getting ourselves into. And um, I, I just wonder if those conversations are, are really different now considering you know just how a lot of those kids have grown up over the course of the last 20 years yeah well I I do for the past couple of years um well the pandemic was hard but I've been doing some truth and recruitment work in Bay Area schools and um and like little programs um, online and stuff yeah. but um I think for the most part yeah a lot of kids the, the economic draft is still very real Yep. And there's this sense of, oh, well, the, you know, like, we're not really technically at war anymore. And they're kind of, I, I get the sense that they're getting lulled into this sense of complacency because the war up until very recently, you know, we were still in Afghanistan, but it never made the news anymore. Right. It, it was so like out of sight, out of mind. And, uh, you know, there weren't a ton of troops over there anymore. And so they just get the sense like, oh, well, now would be a really great time to join the military because we're not involved in any conflict. Nothing will happen. Like, I'll just right. serve my time and then I'll get, you know, money for school or I'll, I'll have this career because I need to get out of wherever the heck I am and things aren't looking well for me. And um, yeah, and they, they're extremely naive and don't, don't know some of the basic things. Like every contract is eight years. I don't care what the recruiter says. Yes. It is eight years. It is eight years. Every contract is eight years. Yes. Because it's the active part and then it's the inactive part. And if they want to call you back up at any point in that eight years, it can be seven years and 200 days and you could get called back into the military. Like yep. you're on the hook for that, for that whole eight years. And I've met people who have, who have um, had that harsh reality, you know, who had, who had been out for several years at that point. Right. And um, so when I was in AIT at Fort Meade for um, for, uh, you know, public relations, um, there was a group of like six or seven who were uh, called back from inactive reserve. And uh, it was happening over over the Christmas exodus. So when you're at training Christmas exodus, you're kind of on break for several days, weeks. I forget how long it is. And so um, I was married at the time. And so my ex-wife and I, we were like just watching TV in the day room in the, at, the, at the barracks. <laughs> and there was a, a girl in there who was um, in the IR who was hanging out there too. And I'm like, Aren't, shouldn't you be home right now? Because like they, they would allow people to go home for, for Christmas break and then come back. She's like, well, she's like, uh, so I am back. And she's like, my husband knocked me up and I'm here to uh, get out of, because all the IR people were going straight to Iraq. It was, they were getting retrained and then boom, you're going, you're going to wherever, right? So <laughs> she had an Iraq baby. And uh, that was also one of those things that, um, that happens when uh, uh, they, they, it's, it was literally deemed Iraq baby. Um, you got pregnant because you were skipping deployment. And I was like, ah, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And also like, so fucked up that a, yeah. women are so desperate. They're like, I, yeah, I, now's the time. Yeah. <laughs> I need a baby right married now. married and already had other kids. And so it's just like, eh, we're just adding to the pile, whatever, you know? Uh, yeah, still. <laughs> oh my God. So many weird, like little intricacies like that. Like uh, there's, there, I, I don't know if it's still happening. I haven't paid attention in a long time, but on Craigslist uh, around um, Fort Bragg in North Carolina, 
women around the base would sell their positive pregnancy tests to other women so that they could uh, convince like the, the, the troop that they had been banging on the weekends that they got knocked up and now they need to get married so they can have like health insurance and stuff basically. Wow. <laughs> and they would go for, you know, 50 bucks, hundred bucks a pop, you know, <laughs> good way and if you're pregnant it was a good way to make a little little side hustle you know right right just yeah. pan on sticks <laughs> yep it's crazy buy a bunch of those and like sell them for 100 bucks a pop yeah it, but, but yeah so these these kids are you know they don't know the basics and so yeah my little truth and recruitment group goes in there and we have a little quiz and they watch this mini documentary and then there's me and another another vet who kind of shares our stories but and we're there to ask, answer their questions because we get some just truly really bizarre questions that um, you have no idea what they're they're wondering and what they have been promised already. You know, yep. some of them have been exposed to recruiters, and they don't know that no, you're not guaranteed the job that you sign up for. You're not all of these things. Oh yeah, know. yeah, that whole thing. Like especially in the National Guard. Like you have to just cross your fingers that there's an opening in the, in the position the, that you want. And then, you know, you have to make sure that you score high enough on the ASVAB and all that other stuff too. Um, where, you know, on the, on the active side, it's way easier to, to land the job that you're looking at. If you score high enough, that's, you know, that's a big if, but um, yeah. Like when I first joined, I, I didn't get the P the PA position at all. I got uh, air, uh, air transportation. Yeah. Um, and, and then, uh, and then I switched, uh, after a year ish time after that. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, and, and it was all luck that I even had the opportunity to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, there's, there's so many things that, like he's just said, like that they're promised that it's just like, ugh, man, there's a, that's a, that's a real dirty version of the truth there that it's like yeah there's some to that but here's the harsh reality you know yeah yeah the recruiter you know they're all sharp looking and they're wearing the uniform they're so confident yeah they appear very trustworthy worthy and knowledgeable and and all that stuff just and like this just total shysters yeah like used car salesman or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah snake oil salesman <laughs> yeah. i mean of the worst variety yeah um we can wrap up here uh so i'll i want to plug the book it's uh breaking cadence where like okay if i want if somebody wants to buy this thing and they want to put the most money in your pocket where should they go to get this thing do you have a website where you sell directly or anything like that yeah yeah you could um get one directly from me and i'll sign it and put a little note in there if you want uh, my website is rosadelduca.com and, and you can order just straight from your your website well you can just email me i have a um, email address breaking cadence at gmail.com okay. or you could you know it's on it's on amazon it's on audible there's a um, audiobook version of it and it's, you know, it's kind of everywhere when you distribute through Amazon, it kind of goes to a, a ton of places. So I, I don't think it's too hard to find. Do you ever get like a surprise? Like this is, how did someone order it through this? Or do you, or do you even see any of that stuff? Well, the orders are so minuscule <laughs> that I normally don't have the luxury of, of wondering that at all. Yeah. Usually uh, I'm giving them away to kids who are considering joining the military. I'm like, why don't you read this? Here, here you go. Here sure, you go. Sure. No, that makes more sense. No, I did this stupid podcast with a, a buddy of mine. Um, and he did, he took care of all the tech side of things. And he would read off like where we got a, a new listener from. It would be from like Hungary. And it would be like from all these like really obscure places. So I didn't know if you had like knowledge to any of that stuff at all. Um, cool. So I don't think you're on Twitter anymore, right? No, it's so toxic. Plug, there. Gonna, it, it's super toxic. That's, that's where I live as far as uh, social media goes. I got rid of Facebook um, and I, you know, I built up a small ish network of people there. Um, but it, is there other places where they can find any of your work that you want to plug that I'll, I'll definitely put in the show notes and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
well, I guess just my website, rosadelduca.com. I am on Facebook, but um, if you, if a stranger sent, wants to friend me, they got to send me a message, message too, because yeah, um, Weird I'm very time. protective of that account. Cause yeah, it's like, it's either or these days, right? Well, I can do Facebook, but not Twitter, or I can do Twitter, but I can't do both. Right. Um, but I'm also a musician. And so my music is up on my website and you can listen to it for, for free there. And I don't know. Awesome. If it's your thing. It's folky. Very folky. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll drive, we'll drive the traffic that direction then. Cool. Um, but yeah, no, this is awesome. We're gonna have to do more of this. Um, I'm gonna start to like make this channel a lot more about this subject. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to help build a larger network so to have some people return and have some fresher voices and faces and things. Um, but with everything that's happening today here on the 22nd of February, these are conversations that need to be had, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah we're just it's you know it's 20 years it's so it's so crazy to think that you and I did this 20 years ago you know I know we're and so old so old but just just it, it makes sense that like here's the next cycle of bullshit war right right on time 20 years later um so it, it, yeah it, it these are a lot more of these conversations need to be had and and uh yeah, and if you know, I, I would love to get involved in some of the stuff with the, uh, you know, talking kids out of joining and and educating them, like really educating them, not getting the, the snake oil pitch like the recruiters do, like you said. Um, yeah, let's those conversations need to be had too. So, uh, either way, we'll we'll probably be talking again in the future. Yeah, well, this is a great project, and I can't wait to see where it goes. And yeah, and thanks for having me on. Awesome. Uh, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Okay.